Tonight, Legacy Church is thrilled to welcome back Pastor Luke Barnett, the senior pastor of Dream City Church in Phoenix, Arizona. Pastor Luke leads and serves as a foundation board member for the Phoenix Dream Center, which offers hunger relief, medical programs, Bible studies, and so much more to those in need. He has devoted his life to building and leading innovative churches and has led so many to Christ by loving people, cultivating community, and inspiring hope. Please welcome Pastor Luke Barnett. Hey, Legacy Church, so good to see you all tonight. Oh, come on, let's give Jesus Christ a great applause for all he's done for us. It is so great to be with you. You can be seated tonight. I'm joined by my beautiful wife, Angel. And uh, we are so honored to be here with you. Angel wants to say a quick word of gra- gratitude to all you for what you, how you've helped us up with this helped us out with a special project. Yes, you guys gave to our project up in Colorado City and you helped renovate the compound that used to hold 86 wives basically in human trafficking. Because of your initial gift, we were able to renovate that building so that we can now rescue um, men and women out of that lifestyle. And then you gave again and we were able to purchase the only operating food bank up in the town where that is the only place people can get food. There is no grocery store there. So we're able to regain trust by helping feeding and reaching out to people. We thank you so much, Legacy Church, for all your help. Some of you might be in the dark a little bit. She's talking about Warren Jeffs, who was the infamous polygamist leader up in Colorado City, a little town on the border of Arizona and Utah, about 7,000 people living there right now. When he was put in federal prison for practicing polygamy, uh, his 65th wife escaped, made her way down to Phoenix at our Phoenix Dream Center. She found Jesus Christ. She found her husband there. She was awarded his 10-acre compound as one of his wives. She turned around, gave it to us. We launched Dream City Church and Dream Center up there. And... uh, The same place that was used for polygamy and human trafficking is now being used to rescue young ladies from human sex trafficking. So God has done a great redemptive story there. So thank you so much, Legacy Church. Thank you, Angel. And say it's so great to be here with our wonderful friends, Pastor Steve and Cynthia. Thank you so much for all your love and your friendship. Every time I come to Legacy Church, I feel like I'm not even a Christian walking around this place, seeing so many people just motivated and inspired to do the great things of God. You are, you're amazing. This is the, the America's greatest midweek service right here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You guys are doing a great job, and we're just so honored to be here. And Pastor Steve, thank you so much for your friendship personally to me. And uh, when I became the pastor and followed my dad, he called me and said, I want to be your friend. And we've, we've struck up a great friendship over the years. And Thank you so much for your leadership. You're a phenomenal leader. When I walk around this place, I just say, wow, how God has used you. I know you are so great, uh, grateful for your great pastor here at Legacy Church. It's so amazing to watch. Well, I want to welcome all those who are watching us from the East Mountain Campus. Also, those watching from Facebook Live, the live stream. So we welcome you into our service here tonight as well. The title of my message tonight, and by the way, I was going to speak a totally different message tonight, but uh, I met a gentleman uh, today, and he said that this message inspired him so much from last night, he called all his friends and family and said, you got to come tonight to hear this message. I want to talk to you tonight on the subject of I raise dead things. I raise dead things. Because I believe we serve a God who delights in raising those things that we think are dead in our life back to life. Do you believe that tonight? That's our great God. He delights in doing that. So I want to begin by asking you to close your eyes right now. Just appease me on this. And I want you to imagine that the back of your eyelids are a movie, is a movie screen. And I want you to visualize something in your life right now. A challenge you're going through. Something that you feel like you are powerless on your own to overcome. You all got it? Okay, look this way. I want to talk to you tonight about how God delights in raising the dead things in our life. I want to begin by just talking to you about the difference between hope and optimism. See, hope and optimism are much different things. Uh, Optimism is psychological, but hope is 
theological. Optimism is little orphan Annie singing, the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow. Well, sometimes the sun doesn't come out. That's, that's optimism. But hope is built on something much, much deeper. And the Apostle Paul talks to us about the difference between hope and optimism in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Now, what are jars of clay? That's these bodies that house our spirit. So we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Now let's jump down to verse 16, and let's read these final verses together. Ready? Go. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is just temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So Apostle Paul says, outwardly we are wasting away. In other words, there's an outer you. That's your skin, your hair, and your nails. There's also an inner you. That's your heart, your soul, and your personality. The outer you gets all the attention. The inner you is invisible. The outer you is temporary. The inner you is eternal. The outer you can be hurt, uh, even killed, but no one can touch the inner you without your permission. Oh, one more thing about the outer you. Paul says, outwardly we are wasting away. Sooner or later, old man wrinkle is coming for all of us. And if you don't believe that's true, just turn and look at the person sitting next to you right now, and you will see that old man wrinkle is coming for all of us. You see, around the age of about 25, okay, you can stop looking at that person now, all right? Around age 25, certain changes start to happen to the outer you. Your bones start to lose calcium and they get brittle. Your skin starts to lose elasticity and shrivels. Age spots start to appear in your hands. One day you look down and say, those aren't my hands. Uh, my, those are my dad's hands. Those aren't my hands. You know, your weight uh, begins to shift from the poles of your body toward the equator. Your hair stops growing where you want it to grow, and it boldly begins to grow where no hairs have ever grown before. (laughs) Now, I know some of you are not yet 25 years of age, and you're thinking to yourself, man, that's never going to happen to me. Old age, wrinkled skin, hair loss, weight gain, that'll never happen to me. And those of us who are older and wiser want want you to know that that we understand and, and we love you, but it is going to happen to you. And frankly, we can't wait until it does happen to you. (laughs) Paul says, outwardly we are wasting away. And we live in this culture today who keeps trying and hoping and paying large sums of money, trying to renew the outer man, which is just temporal. It's going to fade away. Now, my dad, you all know my dad. He's my hero. Look at this picture. 81 years old. He is Superman. (laughs) He is my hero. I, he can do anything, my dad. But recently, he learned about the effects of Botox. And he said, man, you know what? If I, if I can start taking some Botox, I think it'll make me look a lot younger. And really, it's done wonders on him. Take a look what it's done. It's just done amazing things for him. I want you to know. He's even started talking like a Brit. I want you to know that. No, with an accent. And look, I am, I'm all for improving the outer man. Botox. Hair plugs, I might need some of those, whatever, you know. You know, working your body out, you know, the cross fitting, all that. But really, that's all outer you stuff. And we live in a culture that fixates on the outer you while giving very little attention to the inner you, which is what really God is concerned about because that's what lasts forever. One time, God sent a prophet named Samuel to anoint a future king of Israel. He was looking for God, God's prized man. And so he goes to the house of Jesse, and Jesse parades his oldest son, his biggest, strongest son, out before the prophet Samuel. Jesse is sure this is going to be the one. 
He's the quarterback on the football team. He was the one who was voted most likely to succeed in high school. He's handsome. He's, he's buff. And Samuel sees him and says, that's got to be the guy. He is so impressive. But God tells Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God says, hey, Samuel, you're a man of God, and you're still focused on the exterior. But what I'm concerned about is what's inside this guy, his heart, his soul, his character, which is infinitely more important than how you look or even how your circumstances go in life. So Paul is writing to people at a church in Corinth. These are real people just like you and I. People who are facing real problems in life. People for whom optimism will never be enough. And this is what Paul says to them and to us tonight. My body is going south in a hurry. Outwardly, I am wasting away. And the wear and tear on my body is not only due to the normal aging process that you folks are experiencing. My body's going south because I've been beaten. I've been stoned. I've been bitten by vipers. I've been locked up in, in cells and stocks. In fact, nothing about my personal outer resume is on the upswing. Not my possessions, not my financial life, not my physical well-being. None of that stuff is on the upswing. But listen to his perspective. I love this. We don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Paul says, look, what's happening to me on the outside doesn't even bother me that much. Because what's happening on the inside is so awesome. Outside, I'm wasting away, but on the inside, I'm coming to life a little more every single day. On the inside, I find myself changing. I find myself growing. I'm not the person today I was yesterday because God is growing me up. I find myself loving people more, even the people who put me here in this prison. Paul says it's the strangest thing. I keep dying on the outside. But I don't lose hope because on the inside, it's like I'm coming to life. And it's just fabulous. And so he says in verse 18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen, that's psychological, that's optimism, that's temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. Now look this way. Paul is reminding all of us here tonight that in the areas of life where so many people pin their ultimate hopes and dreams, their resumes, their homes, their status, their finances, even our physical bodies, it's all wasting away. And we can pump ourselves up and be as optimistic about all that stuff as we want to. But it will never be enough. Because optimism will never be enough. And so here's a question I want all of us to wrestle with in the time that remains here tonight. What do you do in your life when it feels like wasting away is winning? What do you do when you wake up one day and you realize that everything you built your life on, all that optimism will never be enough? Because optimism will never be enough. In the time that remi remains, I want to tell you a story from the Bible that, that really shares the difference between uh, hope and optimism. The kind of hope that transcends optimism. Lazarus lived with his sisters, Mary and Martha. And whenever Jesus would travel to Judea on business, you recall he was a carpenter, he would spend a lot of time with his good friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But one day, Lazarus got sick. Maybe he found a lump on his body. Maybe he got a fever. Happens to people every day because outwardly we are wasting away. And so Lazarus goes in to get whatever kind of medical help was available in those days. I'm sure he was really optimistic when he went to the doctor's office, but all that optimism died in a moment when the doctor shook their head and said, there's nothing that we can do for you. Well, now Mary and Martha are desperate. And we pick the story up in John chapter 11 and verse 3. It says, so the sisters sent word, that they're going to send a person, a messenger to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, why do they send word to Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because they know there's hope in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody say amen. There's healing in the name of Jesus. They've seen Jesus heal people, complete strangers. And Lazarus wasn't a stranger. He was a really good friend of Jesus. In fact, such a good friend, the messenger doesn't even say his name. 
He just says, Lord, the one you love is sick. And Jesus knows who he's talking about. In verse 5, Jesus does a very strange thing. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. That's kind of odd, don't you think? I mean, if you really love someone, the moment you know they're in distress, you stop what you're doing and you go immediately and try to meet their need. But the Bible says Jesus waited for two more days. What's that all about? Well, I'll explain that in just a moment. Finally, after two more days, Jesus says to his disciples in verse 7, let's go back to Judea. Now at this point, there's still a two-day journey away from Judea. And he's already delayed going back for two days. And so finally, when they arrive in Bethany, which is a suburb of Judea, Lazarus has been dead now for four days. And Martha and Mary are surrounded by family and friends, and they're all mourning. They're all crying out. Verse 20 says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she goes out to meet him and says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if only you had been here. If only you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only, if only, if only. I think every one of us in this place tonight have some if onlys in life. If only I would made wiser choices. If only I had gone to the doctor a little sooner. If only I had told her I loved her. If only I had said I forgive you. If only I had raised my children differently. If only, if only, if only. And sometimes it can feel in life sometimes like our if onlys are going to be the end of the story. Just like Mary and Martha felt. But they're not the end because, friends, there is someone that you can take your if onlys to tonight. No matter how dead that thing appears to be in your life, no matter how bad you feel about it, no matter how hurt you've been by it, there is someone you can take your if onlys to, and he would love to bring life to that dead thing in your life. He would love to raise that dead thing. Or Martha brings her if only to Jesus. Maybe she starts off by blaming herself. If only I'd gone in person to Jesus, maybe he had come back in time. But now she turns the blame to Jesus. She says, if only you had come back in time, my brother would not have died. And I love what Jesus says to her in verse 23. Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day, she says, Jesus, I know that some glad morning when this life is over, we're all going to fly away on that day. I know that. I'm, I'm, I have hope for that, but I have very little optimism that anything can be done for my brother right here and now because he's dead. Then Jesus makes this one-of-a-kind statement. I love it. A statement that no other religious leader would ever dare to make. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Don't you believe this? Don't you believe this, Martha? And now we start to understand the difference between hope and optimism. Martin Luther King Jr. was asked one time about the difference between hope and optimism. This is what he said, optimism is a belief in progress, that's psychological. Optimism is a belief that circumstances are going to get better. That's little orphan Annie, the sun's going to come out tomorrow, maybe. Optimism fixes its eyes on what is seen and therefore it will always be on shaky ground. Friends, if you build your life on optimism, you will ultimately lose heart because you are building your life on something that, that's fading away. Outwardly we're fading away. But hope is this conviction that there's another reality. There's another king that exists and is doing very well right now. It's always existed. And that king will have the last word in your life. That is hope. Well, Mary and Martha are way beyond optimism. I mean, Lazarus is dead. Their hearts are broken. And verse 33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was troubled. Now the word weeping here is a, is a little misleading, kind of a bad translation. It's, it's, it implies this thing that we do at funerals, kind of a quiet, polite sniffling, you know. But that's not what's happening in this story. There, there's a wall in Jerusalem called the Great Wailing Wall. People go to this wall and they cry out in anguish in loud voices they're tormented and they, they cry out to God and, and they wail and they, and they lash out and they, and they ask God to meet their needs. That's what's happening here in this story. 
Jesus sees all these tormented hearts, all these people weeping and wailing. And then he turns and he sees the tomb. He sees death. And then we have the shortest verse in all the Bible, just two words. Then Jesus wept. <laughs> Why is Jesus weeping? Isn't Jesus God? Doesn't Jesus know he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead? Of course he does. So why is he weeping? I think this is one of the greatest revelations of God's heart for the people he loves. You see, he, he looks around and he sees this, this tomb that, that is housing this, this dead man, Lazarus. And Mary and Martha believe in their hearts that it's all over with. That there's no hope for a resurrection. And Jesus is going to weep again a few days later. He's going to stand outside the city gates of Jerusalem. And he's going to weep for Jerusalem. All the people who live in that city. All the people trapped in tombs of death like worry and fear and addiction and sin and confusion. Jesus thinks about all the death and all of its form. Injustice and poverty and greed. And he says in Matthew 22, 23, 37, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus looks at my city, Phoenix. Jesus looks at Albuquerque. He looks at America, and he says, how I long to help you. How I long to bring you out of those tombs, but you just won't let me. I had the power to solve your situation, but you just won't let me. Jesus, this tells us a lot about God's heart. He weeps for us. Well, then Jesus stops weeping, and he faces the tomb. Because again, outwardly we are wasting away. And ultimately it leads to tombs in life. And tombs ultimately call for this question. Where are our eyes fixed? Are our eyes fixed on these jars of clay? Are our eyes just fixed on optimism, what we can see? Or are your eyes fixed on what is unseen? A greater hope. For many generations, parents have tucked their children in bed at night. And they said a little prayer like this with their children. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's a cheery way to tuck your kids in bed at night, don't you think? But you know, I found out this week there's actually a second verse to that prayer. I'm not making this up. It goes like this. Our days begin with trouble here. Our life is but a span and cruel death is always near. Night, night, honey, sweet dreams, you know. <laughs> but people would pray this prayer for generations because they want their kids to know that death is real, that outwardly we are wasting away. Death is real, but it's not the end. I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's hope. That's what living in hope is all about. And there's another way to think about these jars of clay, which is the ultimate end of the optimism road. Mel Blank was a man who was called the man of 1,000 voices. He was a voice behind all the cartoon characters in the Looney Tunes. How many watched Looney Tunes when you were growing up? Most of you did. Yeah, me too. At the end of every episode of the Looney Tune cartoons, Porky Pig would appear. Do you recall what he would say? Evity, evity, evity. That's all, folks. The show is over. Well, Mel Blanc died. And you're never going to guess what his family put on his tomb. That's all, folks. You see, every tomb calls for the question, for, the, for, for this question. Is Porky Pig right? Is that all there is, folks? Is the show really over? Jesus faces the tomb. He says in verse 39, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, by this time there's a really bad odor. For he's been in there for four days. Now, if you know anything about Martha's reputation, she was a meticulous hostess. In fact, Martha's last name may have been Stuart. We don't know about that. We're still checking on that. <laughs> and because she was so concerned about her guests, she knew the moment they broke that seal, it was going to release an awful stench from this body. And so she says, Jesus, let's just not go there. You tried really hard to get back in time. You blew it, Jesus. He's dead. He's gone. It's over. The show's over. It's time to go home, folks. The four-day mark was also significant because there's a common Jewish folk belief that for the first three days, the spirit would hover around the tomb in hopes to get back in the body. But after the four days, because decay had set in, the spirit would just give up and go away. 
And the point that John wants us to know in the story is that, is that Lazarus is really dead, okay? He had flatlined. He had kicked the bucket. He was worm food, six feet under and pushing up daisies. That's all, folks. The show's over. Good night. Well, Jesus isn't concerned about any of that. He says in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Here's the deal. Had Mary and Martha had their way, they would have missed a miracle. They would have missed seeing a resurrection. This tells us sometimes that we may weep and we may cry because we want things our way. But God always has a much better way if we will trust him and hang in there and not quit. (laughs) Take away the stone, Jesus said. So they rolled it away. Can you imagine the drama in this moment? Verse 41 says, then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. In other words, he was saying, Father, I thank you that Lazarus is now alive. Now, Lazarus has not yet come out of the tomb. So how does Jesus know that he's alive? No stench. There's no bad odor. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. What does he mean by that? Because he had not prayed before he said, take away the stone. You recall those two days when Jesus delayed coming back home? He wasn't doing nothing, friends. He was doing the very thing that matters most to Christians. He was doing the thing that keeps hope alive inside of us. He was praying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let your kingdom come down to this earth right now in this situation. And then Jesus said in verse 43, Lazarus, come out And Lazarus, a dead man, now alive, comes walking out of a tomb. Can you imagine being there to see that resurrection? I mean, can you imagine the celebration that took place after this? All the partying that took place in that village? But curiously, we don't read of any celebration of any kind in the book of John. And I think it's because that this is not the ultimate resurrection story. Because Lazarus himself, he's still mortal. In fact, the last time we hear about Lazarus is the next chapter. The Bible says the chief chief priests try to find a way to kill Lazarus because of the effectiveness of his testimony. Now, that's kind of bad, don't you think? You beat death one time, now you got to face it all over again, right? It's, It's kind of bad. However, the ultimate resurrection will happen just a few days later. Because just as Jesus Christ was the master teacher of life and the master liver of life, he also mastered death. And when he burst out of the tomb on Easter, death was ultimately defeated. Which means, friends, wasting away does not have the last word in our lives. Come on, say amen. Which means, which means that Porky Pig was wrong. Porky Pig was wrong. That's not all, folks. That's not the end, not for followers of Jesus. And therefore, we do not lose heart. We cannot lose heart. I'll just close with this last little story. I want you to look at this picture with me, if you would, on the screen. The title of that painting is Checkmate. And the story is told of two friends who are traveling in Europe, touring all these great museums. And so they're traveling, they're touring this museum, and they come across this, this picture. Leave the picture up if you would for a moment if you, on the screen. And they see this picture of a, of a, of a guy who is, uh, looks very much like the devil. And he's playing an ordinary looking guy in chess. Checkmate was the title of the picture. Well, one of these guys happened to be an international chess champion. And so he told his buddy, I want you to go ahead and tour the rest of the museum. Something's not right about this picture. And he stood there and he looked at it and he studied it. Well, about a half an hour later, his buddy comes back and he sees his friend pointing his finger at the painting and screaming out loud, the the picture, it's wrong. It says that the game is over. It says checkmates. But, But the king... The king still has one more move. The game is not over. we got to find the artist and tell him it's not right. The king still has one more move. A Philistine giant is taunting the armies of God. And one day a little boy shows up with McDonald's hamburgers for his brothers who are in the battle. And before we know it, this little boy jumps over the embankment and starts running toward this giant with nothing in his hand but a sling and five smooth stones and unbridled passion to do something great for God. And he takes that little sling and he begins to whirl it around like this. 
And everyone's saying, this is over. It's checkmate. This battle is done before it even began. But God supernaturally charged that little boy's hand. And when he charged it, it went from to that's where the whole idea of the weed eater came from, right there, the story of David and Goliath. Everyone said, checkmate, the show's over, but the king still had one more move, and God guided that stone like a laser guided missile, and it took down Goliath. A man named Daniel gets thrown into a den of lions because he refuses to stop praying to his God. And these lions have not been fed in days, and they're hangry. They're so hungry, they're upset. And it looks like Daniel is going to be in the Daniel sandwich. That's all, folks. The show's over. But when morning comes around, they find that God had put the lions on a low-protein diet because Daniel had not been touched. He was doing just fine because the king still had one more move. Moses. Moses convinces a million oppressed slaves to run away from the most powerful man on planet Earth. And now they find themselves trapped. The Red Sea before them. The Egyptian National Guard behind them, they're closing in with obvious evil intent. This has all the makings of an old-fashioned holocaust, except for the fact that the king still had one more move. And God miraculously part of the Red Sea, allowing the, the Israelites to cross through on dry ground because the king still had one more move. Jesus goes down to Judea to help a really good friend of his, Lazarus, and it cost him his life. Because a few days later on Good Friday, they tried him, they judged him, they beat him. They hung him on a cross and they killed him. They put his body in a tomb to rot and decay the way every other human being has rotted and decayed in history. And they said to everyone, it's over with, checkmate. That's all, folks, time to go home. But they were wrong, friends, they were wrong because the king still had one more move and Jesus Christ rose to life in resurrection power. And I've come here tonight to tell you, Legacy Church, I don't care what you're going through right now. The king will have the last move in your life as well. He will have the last move. I don't know what wasting away looks like for you right now in your life. Maybe it's a health thing. Maybe it's a marriage that's falling apart or is falling apart. Maybe it's a son or daughter that you pray for all the time, and it seems like the more you pray for them, the further they get away from God, and your heart is broken. And, and, and you seem like all the optimism you have for that situation is, is fading away. The king still has the last move with your son or daughter. Maybe it's work-related. Maybe you or someone you love is facing what Lazarus faced, and it looks like a grave. Whatever you're facing... The promise that Jesus gives you tonight is not the promise of optimism. It's the promise of ultimate hope. It's the promise that even though it may feel like checkmate in your life right now, the king, the king still has the last move. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet for a closing prayer. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. Just close yourself away with God right now. This ministry of time is focused on two different groups of people. First is for those of you who have built your entire life on optimism, trying to pump yourself up to face another day, to face the job. Life to you is eating and sleeping and going to bed, getting up, going to work, and just repeating that process over and over and again. It just becomes so tiring. It's become so difficult trying to pump up enough optimism to keep you fired up in life. You need the hope that Jesus Christ offers to you today. You need to anchor your life on something that's much deeper than optimism. It's on Christ's eternal hope. Right now as I say these words, some of you can feel this deeply in your spirit. Maybe you've come here tonight, you're, you're hoping that there's just something you can just latch on to to inspire you, to help you go just one more day. There's a God who loves you. There's a God who would love to put his presence inside of you so that every single day that you live your life, you can feel his blessed hope inside of you. 
And, and my prayer for you tonight is you would get, grab a hold of that hope. You would ask him to forgive you of your sins and to take up residence in your life, to make you born again, born of his spirit, so you can live the life that God wants you to live. So right now, all across this place, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you'll say, Luke, what you said tonight really resonates with me. I, I believe in God. I believe the Bible is true. I, I believe there's a heaven and a hell, but I'm not living that abundant life that Christ promised I could live. And it's because I haven't put my ultimate trust and my ultimate hope in Jesus Christ. Friends, you want to put your ultimate hope in something that can never be taken away from you. I, I meet so many people who put their ultimate hope in their business, and their business crashes. There goes their hope. So many people put their hope in the economy. The economy crashes. There goes their hope. People even put their hope in their family, their spouse. Family members dies. Spouses leave sometimes. There goes their hope. You want to put your ultimate hope in something that cannot be taken away from you. And, and no one can take Jesus Christ away from you. He'll be with you always. Put your ultimate hope in Jesus Christ. He will never let you down. So all across this place, while heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you say tonight, I want to put my ultimate hope in Jesus. I want to ask him to be the, the leader of my life, the savior of my life. I want to pray for you right now. Where every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if that's you, would you just slip your hand up just so I know who I'm praying with? I want to put my ultimate hope in Jesus Christ tonight. Just raise your hands. Yes, I see those hands. Thank God. How many others? I want to put my, my ultimate hope in Christ. Yeah, I see those hands. Thank God. Thank God. Just raise your hand up and down. God sees your hand. And now would you say these words right from your heart to God? You can put your hand down. If you raise your hand, he's already seen your heart. He knows what you're feeling right now. But he says we must confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And we must ask him to forgive us personally of our sins. So right now, all across this place, would you just repeat these words after me? Say these right to God. You're not praying to a church or an individual. You're praying to God right now. Just say these words to him. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, today I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Plant your presence inside of me. I need a leader. I need a savior. And I'm choosing tonight to live my life for you and to follow you. You said in the Bible, if I would ask you, you would forgive me. And I believe it's true. And I receive your forgiveness now. I become a child of God. Thank you for adopting me into your wonderful family. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank God for what he's done tonight. For all those who said yes to God. Now just before I, I turn the service over to the pastor, about 25 minutes ago I asked you to close your eyes. And imagine that the back of your eyelids was a movie screen. And for you to think about a great challenge that you're going through right now in your life. How many of you did that? How many of you saw something? Now, if you're like me, when someone asked me to do that, I think of a, of a challenge, like the most pressing challenge. And sometimes the first one is like so far gone, like that's impossible. So you quickly flicker to the second one, right? Like the first one, I'll just go to this one. I want you to go back to the first one. Because that's the one that I believe that God wants to tackle tonight. That's the one he wants to bring back to life tonight. So right now all across this place, if you say, Luke, I saw something in my mind's eye a while ago, a challenge, something that I've given up on. It appears to be dead in my life. And you know what? I want to ask God to raise that dead thing back to life tonight. I want to pray for you right now. How many would say there's something in my life that, that the Holy Spirit brought to my attention tonight? I want, God, I want to ask God to help me with that situation. I'll, I'll just raise your hand all across this place. If that's you, I want to pray for you right now. Would you close your eyes? Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this place who have raised their hands tonight. First of all, I pray for, for kids who are far from you tonight, God. Kids who are, who are not serving you. They're out there in the world. 
And these mothers and these fathers, Lord, they prayed for their kids. They've, they've asked you, Lord, to, to bring them back home. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would bring no pleasure, no joy in their lifestyle until they come back to you. Lord, that every single one of our children would come back to you and, and serve you with all of their hearts. We claim our kids in the name of Jesus. Come on, help me pray tonight. Father, I pray for people in this place who are facing illnesses right now. Some are even facing terminal illnesses. The doctors have said that it's terminal. But, Lord, we thank you that we serve a king who has the last move in our lives. We pray that you would resurrect these bodies tonight. That you would just apply your healing touch to all those who are sick in this place tonight. We believe with all our hearts that the show is not over, that the king still has the last move. Father, I pray for broken relationships, mother and father and, 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 uh, and, uh, mothers and, uh, with children and fathers with their children. Father, uh, these relationships that are broken here, I pray in Jesus' name that you would once again begin to resurrect these broken relationships so there can be peace in the family of God. We claim these, these pure and these right relationships for your glory. Father, I lift up these people in the, here today who are, have businesses that they want to be used for your glory, God. They so want to, want to bless your kingdom. And you give them a big dream, but Lord, they've, they've earned up to block, block walls and, and obstacles along the way. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name tonight that once again you'd raise up these businesses. Lord, you would break down those these walls so that your people can be used of you the way you desire to use them. Father, all across this place tonight, all those tombs that we're experiencing in our life, we pray you would raise those dead things up and we give this truth to you tonight, Lord, knowing that you indeed had the last move in our lives. We love you and we celebrate. We're going to walk out of here tonight with our shoulders back, our heads held high, looking for your answer around every bend, around every turn, knowing that you have the last move in our life. In Jesus' name, and all those who agree, say a big amen. 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 God bless you, Legacy.